delighted to have you back to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This happening to be the 277th episode. And you are our accumulated viewer number. Thank you, Eric, for bringing this up. The number here, you read it down there. So uh, welcome back to our Boston Banish Boost episodes. This is volume 14. And our guest, and by this time co-host, is uh, <laughs> the leader of the Boston uh, Office of Banish Architecten, and that is Matt Noblet. Um, Matt, uh, great to have you back. And it is our DeSoto <coughs> Brown in his Bishop Museum back in Honolulu, Hawaii, and me, Martin Despang, from near Munich, Germany. And we'll continue to talk about how a building that is uh, doing well in a bioclimatic way, both in the cold winter, which it has right now, and also in the warm summer, which we have all the time back in Honolulu. But before we do that, we will look a little bit at world politics and democratecture and autocrat detecture when we come together in a minute. All right, guys, so here is our world architecture. Uh, we're coming full circle because we started out these show sequences and my uh, sweetie uh, Suzanne, our exotic esca escapism expert, always says uh, one can materialize things. Hopefully I did not do this when we were talking about Bolsonaro, uh, hopefully not being Brazil's or fellow tropics president anymore which um, I materialized that, I guess, because he didn't. Uh, but uh, fortunately, we have to come back to that uh, related to architecture. And I let you guys wonder what this is about and get some discussion going here. Darned if I know. <laughs> no. uh, the, Brazil just underwent a similar event politically as to what occurred in the United States in January 6th when the uh, riots occurred in Washington, D.C. Brazil has its own modern architecture capital, which is called Brasilia. That is a city that they built from scratch intentionally to be a new capital. And it was designed in the mid-century modern style. And the mobs that attacked it uh, caused a great deal of damage to the inside and the outside of some of these buildings. And they destroyed some of the historic pieces which were in there. And me being a person of uh, somebody who works in a museum, that's something that upsets me a great deal when uh, unique pieces that can never be replicated are wrecked by mobs. And so that's something that we just saw happen. And um, I'm not happy about it. And that's not just in addition to all the politics and the trauma that that caused. Yeah, and also coming first circle, uh, Matt, um, the uh, inaugural project of your founding father's legacy, Gunter Benisch in Munich. We just talked about the Olympics. Uh, you just made me aware that there was a great 50-year um, anniversary exhibit about it. And um, the year when Brasilia was uh, commissioned and built, Soto, that was pretty close to your childhood, statehood, uh, late 50s, actually early 60s, 1960. Uh, the uh, uh, state capital in Honolulu couldn't follow that fast. I was just off the phone with our friend Bundet, who says hi to both of you. And his uh, son, Rich, young age of the 90s, was instrumental with Warnicke on the state capital. But that took, you know, granted an architectural competition. That's how you acquire most of your work. Uh, very impressively met. Um, that was a competition, too. And it took until 1969. <laughs> what impressed me the most, Matt, and maybe you can say a couple of things because you just said you have been there even more recently than I was proud of myself because I took the picture on the right row, the two middle pictures, the door handle, the stairs is me almost exactly a year, year ago going coming through our former capital again, which um, uh, your guys' firm or the inaugural part of the firm had built our former capital in Bonn. And that was in the 80s. And the 80s, again, we don't remember as the best uh, times, zeitgeist-wise and political leadership. 
at all. So to me, while the Olympics from the 70s is sort of, you know, swimming with a flow, I guess, of progressiveness that pretty much was vanishing, um, unfortunately, uh, quite uh, fast uh, in the 80s and still, or maybe because uh, Gunther and your and his crew was able to manifest his uh, philosophy of having been a submarine commander and have <laughs> and have told himself if I ever get out of this mess uh, i will make sure that no one is ever trapped in space and he was <laughs> able to that uh, as far as um, you know the piece of architecture where our elected politicians um do uh, you know make decisions for us and as i said in the inaugural there's actually a very similar attitude visible in uh, both the uh, um, Hawaii State Capitol in Honolulu and this one here, that in the chambers, the general public who elected the ones down there can actually look down there. They can press their nose against the glass mm -hmm. and look at the ones down there who do the job for them. And that has always impressed me. Yeah, I mean, I think the other aspect of both of those projects that it always strikes me as just the kind of inherent optimism that they represent um, and, and a, the, the notion that, um, you know, architecture can manifest the sort of democratic spirit of government um, very profoundly in terms of its ability to communicate to people that uh, their elected officials are there to do their work, that they're working on their behalf and they can see what's going on. Um, very, you know, openly behind uh, glass walls and and not be sort of um, squirreled away behind giant uh, sort of monumental facades and things of that nature. So um, at that, I think both projects um, very much work at that level, which um, is not something, I mean, I think it also, it, it, there's also something about the sort of the newness of a certain of certain democracies and their ability to have or their op the opportunity they have to um, it sort of redefine themselves architecturally versus you know we've never had that we've never had to do that here in the states and so a lot of our government buildings I think look of the vintage when they were last really when the when the government and, and its kind of visual apparatus was conceived uh, we continue to sort of live under that um, that that regime in a sense yeah and i think that that is exactly applicable to the hawaii state capitol which when it was completed in 1969 got a lot of publicity throughout the united states for being modern and not looking like a greek temple because everything else most other states not all but most other states had things that, again, looked like they had been built thousands of years ago by the Greeks that everybody looked back to as this is the way a government building must look. And the Hawaii State Capitol is not without its comparable elements to Greek architecture, but at the same time, it's completely different. And the openness that we just discussed is manifested in the Capitol by being literally the center part 100% open to the wind, the rain, and all of the outside saying that, look, we're in the tropics. We don't have to close this part off, be in this open space and feel it and see it and experience the weather that we're blessed with. Yeah, absolutely. And not to forgetting to mention the architects of not where that we're looking at our fellow tropics in Brazil, which is a tropical climate as well. These were Lucio Costa as more the urban city planner, Oscar Niemeyer as the architect, and then Borla Marx as the landscape architect working together. And to sort of, I've been showing with you our sort of substitute honeymoon island, which they call Europe's Hawaii, which is Madeira. And the show quote at the very top right is up sneaking to a hotel that Niemeyer has designed. And you see here our exotic escapism experts chatting up uh, some staff so I can do my secret photo shooting there. <laughs> <laughs> the ramp going down into the main dining hall that is full of vintage Niemeyer furniture, which alone is worth a fortune. And just as this sort of built in a ramp uh, slash seating area with this contrast and a nice complementation of concrete and wood and steel, 
that again, um, when I was pressing my nose against the um, the, the the capital in in Bonn, the Bundes, um, that stare that is very Bainishy, and all you know together is that total piece of artwork uh, that the outside and the inside make. So that that picture to the left that irritates you as the archivist, where these rioters are carrying out a Le Corbusier chairs and some nice wood and upholstery vintage mid-century furniture. And Matt and I, we were wondering before the show if these uh, basically beach chairs, lounge chairs are theirs or whatever that was in any case, um, kind of um, kind of irritating on many levels. Um, you are always looking forward to Soto to your weekly German lesson. So for that, not to disappoint you and the audience, we go to the next slide. <laughs> and uh, we promise to help you always. But this this news from a German NTV is actually preceding the other one uh, that was all over the place when they basically were invading uh, the which they called a presidential uh, palace, by the way. But this one here was even before that a couple of days on that very tragic uh, January 6th, that was very tragic a year ago in the United States. Um, and here a year after they reported on basically the um, the first lady, um, you know, Lula da Silva's wife was uh, was um, basically on camera and she walked the journalists through the palace and showed how Bolsonaro has basically uh, treated it pretty bad in uh, cleaning it out. And you got to wonder where all that furniture. And we had a discussion before the show that we should echo and share with, with the audience, this Soto. And also trashed some things and threw artwork on the ground and were damaging it. So very obviously uh, very disrespectful of when we say architecture is an expression of its zeitgeist, then uh, his very reactionary thinking mentality is basically opposing the very progressive democratic that is embodied through architecture, right? As a representation of zeitgeist. Well, the thing that comes to my mind is something we've discussed a great deal in this show in the past, which is sort of the balance and or the battle between traditional and modern. And in some situations, uh, which we've talked about, there are situations where governments decree that you cannot have modern architecture, that you must look to the past. You must re sort of revive or revitalize this idealized past when everything was good and everything was under control and they didn't have all these tumultuous difficulties. Well, all of that is nonsense. Everything was difficult in the past, just like it is today. And trying to hearken back to that in the buildings that you make and the interiors you live in is pointless because it's a fantasy. It's not true. There was no idealized time. So this is something I think that embodies that. And it is simple for particularly right wing people to say, get rid of the modern, destroy the modern, cover up the modern. We want to go back to our idealized past. And obviously, I don't want to destroy the past. But at the same time, I know that the past was not a golden age. Yeah. And how controversially uh, architecture can be also shows, which is a preview of a show to come about, which we basically um, working titled potentially Germany's most American architect, Zepp Ruf. So the column on the very right, Matt, you want to um, tell the audience what that is? The whole building behind the images, the Kanzler Bungalow? So to speak. Oh yeah. So this was the uh, this was a uh, well. I was going to say modest house. I mean, by by some standards, it's modest, but it's a, it's a it's rather true. Uh, it's true. still to these standards. Yeah. Right, but a very very. Uh, I mean, from from I'd say our perspective, lovely uh, residence for the for the chancellor in Bonn uh, for uh, living and, and entertaining, but that went through. Uh, a well, it went through a variety of of uh, chancellors uh, and chancellorships uh, to a great um, variety of opinions as to its worth and qualities, <laughs> and also subsequent additions and subtractions based on uh, sort of cycles of taste. Yeah, and some more German uh, lessons for you to solve. We help you for you so that. 
the press, while um, Ludwig Erhard, which was our second president chancellor, after Adenauer, Adenauer was the first who was this very old school, also up in age, hardcore, conservative kind of guy. Ludwig Erha was really uh, representing and embracing the younger generation of a more open, a younger, a more progressive Germany. And so he commissioned this uh, by uh, to this um, um, architect from here, from Munich, Sepp Ruf. And as you said, Matt, it went through immediate successor, probably, you know, for obvious reasons or understandable reasons a little bit. He totally dismissed it. It went back to Adenauer, who went as extreme to say the architect should be imprisoned for what he did. And then uh, certain ones, Helmut Kohl, who is the uh, Zeitgeist counterpart of uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, representing the conservative or reactionarily conservative 80s, moved in for almost two decades, but always hated it and always voiced himself and like, you know, put in the <laughs> the light uh, ceiling thing, their installation. And he was such a clumsy big guy that he hit his knees and elbows and was always complaining. And by the way, they had to pay for it. They had to pay rent. And he said, the rent is too higher for what I get. So he was constantly bragging, <laughs> but still living in it, which we give him time. And, you know, who we uh, never really liked as and increasingly less, who was shamefully from my hometown, uh, Gerhard Schröder, Putin's poser and buddy, uh, <laughs> although, you know, he could say, well, it was reunification. It was time to move into Berlin, but yet some time that he could have gone there. So uh, even, but even before the whole like love and hate, you know, whoever was it, the general public during the uh, basically promotion of it under Erhard in the side, guys, they dismissed it, uh, dismissed it as Palais Schaumbach. Do you have any idea what that could mean to Soto? Uh, is that what we just talked about minutes ago? The, the, the bubble bath? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Matt, you want to help out what, what that, why they say that? Uh, well, I think it probably, probably the comment works on two levels, right? One, one is the the presence of the the installation of the the actual pool uh, in the in the residence, and another one is, uh, I mean, I I guess I always interpreted it as having something to do with just the sort of the the uh, kind of luxurious nature of the place to the average person. Yeah, and that means the other one was Ludwig's Lust, so Ludwig's first name of that chancellor but also the King Ludwig that we all remember who had blessed us with the lovely, um, uh, what's it called, the castle? I will uh, not even remember it. No, it's kind of <laughs> Ludwig's, it, was, it was also called Ludwig, Ludwig's Lust, yeah? Schloss Ludwig's Lust. Ludwig's Lust, exactly, which is basically, you know, a reactionary thing at its time. At that time, Gropius had built the Fagos Barica, and it was just basically an Excalibur Vegas-like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> thing from the past. So that's that's what again for a very modest and moderate pavilion, and the, the pool did it. Yes, Palais Schaumburg is uh, you know, and Palais Schaumbad bubble bath gets us to the next slide because pools to Soto were very American. Almost no one was able to afford a pool when you guys brought us back on our feet. A pool was considered to be something highly you know luxurious to say the least or decadent. Of course, for Americans, as we see the show quote, we compared, uh, you know, residences of presidents, it was almost the standard you have to have. And so here we went through uh, Nancy and Ronnie when they were visiting Hawaii at the top left. But when they were back in, uh, in California, they basically were in this ranch house, which was also relatively modest, uh, and it had a relatively large pool. And, and you told me a whole lot about how the fossil fuel industry was teaming up uh, and working with. You want to reiterate that? And this, well, we have, have a picture at the bottom left of that show. Well, Eric, if you can bring this up, where they're sitting around the table, the whole Reagan family. 
Well, before Ronald Reagan became the president and a very well-known politician, he had been an actor in Hollywood. So, of course, he was very accustomed to living in Hollywood style. And in the 1950s, he was the host of a variety of television shows before, again, his political career. And he was the spokesperson at some points during that TV career for General Electric. So there was a series of ads, TV ads, in which Ronnie and Nancy showed you around their modern 1950s house in California, showing off all the wonderful things that were available through electricity and the different types of mood lighting and the different uh, wonderful appliances they had. Well, this is very typical of the time period in which the utility companies up until the energy crisis in the early 1970s used to actively advertise for consumers to use more gas and more electricity in living the modern American dream. Yeah, and this gets us back for the seven minutes left to your project, talking, representing the zeitgeist of what the zeitgeist of these days should be, leading <laughs> progressively into the future, reconnecting back to, to whom Ronnie is shaking hands to say unfortunately goodbye is to Jimmy Carter. And hopefully you're shaking Jimmy's hand again because he's still alive, getting close to how old your mother became, the Soto, who uh, you just lost um, uh, last week. And so um, hopefully, again, this is uh, coming full circle, you shaking hands with, uh, with Jimmy, because I remember that my uh, dear mentor and buddy and collaborator on Fry Auto on the 67 uh, Pavilion in, in Montreal, Larry Medlin, told me when he was working at the University of Arizona, the day Reagan took office, his environmental research lab funding was pulled. So um, obviously we need this back. So um, and this is part of the avoid to say mission, because that's what you guys are not at all about. But the philosophy of the building here that, you know, while Ronnie Reagan's, uh, you know, residence was embracing the fossil and General Electric, you guys are basically embracing um, the, the post-fossil, but you're not doing this in a finger-pointing way. You're doing this in a very playful, again, in the, in the tradition of Banish. And I just want us to um, a bit and look at, at the architecture, how uh, gracefully that staircase is, first of all, in its materialization, it's almost like a carpet, right, that you roll out in wood versus, I guess, it's probably polished um, concrete, if I mm -hmm. can guess, Correct. because the thermally activated surface, which you guys are all about, right, which cools and heats the building. <clears throat> and then look at the, the gracefulness of the, the cold necessary guardrail to hold on that is a separated element uh, that is detached from the guardrail that we talked about last time. So the two elements are clearly distinguished from each other, not just sort of in in their in their materiality. One being steel, the other one is wood. Is wood, and the steel is is sort of regular and right angled and square profiled, while the handrail is soft and round and tactile. And I just I have to. I have to ask something quickly. Is that metal mesh that is forming the barrier of the wall slash guardrail? It is, Casoto. Yeah. That's the That's one, one, we one of our about. favorites. That's one of our favorites. <laughs> That's why I specifically asked about it. Exactly. Yeah. I should, if, you, if you had only known before we did this, you could have invested in it. <laughs> <laughs> did you use a lot of it? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I just want to encourage the people to look at everything. So the ceiling, just like I think in some of the last shows, which impressed me in the Bundestag was that in an all glass room, how do you get um, basically soundproofing and mm. acoustic? And then, you know, Günther and team developed and invented this sort of plastic micro perforated stuff that the sound gets trapped in there. And here, this is now guessing you that the, the linear striped corduroy texture must be baffled uh, that probably have, you know, acoustical function. And then you see how playful the lighting as, as fluorescent tubes is seated in there and then gets joined by the, by the skylines. So there's the real, compositional quality that is playful, that makes you not think in a 
technocratic way about okay, this is off the grid. This is yes, it is, but it does it in such a playful way that one can only say how what's not to like about. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, that's something that's really important to us, I think, is the notion that um, not only do you have to not necessarily sacrifice uh, well-being and, and, and kind of well-feeling in a building that uh, attempts to use a minimal amount of fossil energy to, to, to operate, but in fact, that can become a kind of an, a point of inspiration or a way to celebrate uh, and, and discover new forms of architecture uh, and new opportunities um, through solving some of these more, let's say, quantitative problems that uh, typically sort of are focus around energy. And I think that's, I think that that this kind of notion of an integrated approach to design, it tries to, you know, not see those, uh, the, the sort of the limitations or the desire to limit uh, expense and, and energy as, as a, hindrances but really is opportunities to to discover a new way to 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 exist in a space and in a building that's really what what i think we that's what motivates us absolutely what i what i like to call the art the high diplomization of birkenstock architecture or to be gender <laughs> right birkenstock architecture which is another german product right that you know, when some say we Germans have been maybe for a little bit longer, you know, environmentally interested, but we also have been dismissed for just being too uptight about it. Yes, it was the most healthy <laughs> shoe, but only nurses and tree huggers wore them. And at some point, you know, Birkenstock asked themselves the same question. What can we do to open ourselves to, to a larger audience? And in their case, it is, of course, to sell more shoes. But in your case, it is to convince, you know, such a not necessarily very open minded institution as Harvard is, as you had pointed out to the place next door where your father, DeSoto, went to school, <laughs> to the business school, and you uh, men had to present to some of the deans there, and they weren't necessarily uh, automatically open. So it's certainly, certainly almost a smuggler's tool to basically sneak these things in by saying, hey, make a <laughs> building that you feel good in and, and all these things you don't even have to know about, you don't even have to see. I mean, if you pay attention to you will, but it's not, you know, in your faith. Mm -hmm. Okay, but after all, we're at the end of time, but after all, it's still, you know, it's, it's a research building. It has laboratories and, you know, things like that that might not be quite as sexy on the you know, initially and automatically, but how you dealt with these, we will share with you uh, next week and following. Look forward to have you back for that. And until then, stay democratically architectural and architectural. <laughs>